On behalf of the Board of Directors um, of the Bear County Health Collaborative, I welcome you to the 2013 Bear County Community Health Assessment um, rollout. This year, the uh, Health Collaborative celebrates 16 years of service to the community. Since 1990, uh, 1997, I'll speak to that a little bit later again. Um, what started off as a special interest project for a group of four hospital leaders is now a community-wide collaborative effort. A small group expanded out to a very wide community stakeholder group. What began as a reasonable financial decision um, to do these assessments on behalf of the hospitals uh, is now the catalyst for conversation such as the one we'll have this morning and action uh, such as the community health improvement plan that we'll talk about later that yields a better return for the entire community. Sixteen years later, uh, the board is a diverse group made up of hospital systems, community-based organizations, universities, business, and community members whose mission continues to be to improve the health status of our community through collaboration. And we'll speak to that again in a little while, I think. Um, we're very privileged and honored to host this event uh, today. This is how many have we done so far? Five. We've done five of these events so far. And uh, so again, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share this final re report information uh, with you. This time I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Lutz, who is the executive director of the board. Thank you, thank you Steve. He's much taller than I am, so I'm gonna lower this a little bit. So as Steve mentioned, the um, 2013 Community Health Assessment is the fifth assessment that has been conducted and provided to community. And in 2010, uh, we started to do some tracking of information um, for the very first time in order to look at process improvement and ensure that we were delivering the type of report um, that was going to be useful for our community and that we could really build from uh, from that point forward. So I'd like to just take a, a moment to share some of the information that we found from the 2010 assessment and its tracking uh, methods. So about 2% of the users for the health assessment report are actually using uh, it for strategic planning purposes. This is any organization, whether it be business or community stakeholder, that's really looking to realign um, their programming or their mission. Um, they're using the report in order to be able to look for the health indicators, look for gaps in service, and then align their strategy towards meeting those missions. 8% uh, is being used by hospital administration for IRS requirements. 20% of the uh, report is being used for community program development. This is actually looking at new built infrastructure around community or looking for changes within existing programs in order to continue to, the, the meet, to meet the mission of, of their target population. 30% uh, of users are uh, using it for academic research or higher education. These are people that are graduating either undergraduate or graduate studies in public health, community health, uh, or even research or grant writers that are, are looking to advance or publish papers. And 40% of the use of the report is for grants and funding opportunities for the community. So um, since the 2010, for the 2010, over 2,000 copies of the executive summary were distributed, and there were more than 5,000 online downloads. Um, this does not include colleague shares. So this does include, it doesn't include when we, you know, have requests for PDF and then those go forwarded over to other colleagues. Um, the community health assessment was also shared with other, community, uh, other communities at the Association of Community Health Improvement. Um, conference and the American Public Health Association conference. And we were also asked by the Robert Wood Johnson, actually invited by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to conduct a webinar for uh, county health rankings uh, with roadmaps to health. Since then, our collaborative and the report has been used as a reference by several states as a model for conducting health assessments to include California, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Illinois, and not so far away, our neighbors in Austin. So we would like to um, recognize those efforts because although we're talking about a community health assessment, really what we're talking about is, is our community here, all of you guys as stakeholders. And we couldn't do any of this work without the, the tremendous support and generous uh, funding support from our, from our sponsors. So I'd like to give recognition and thank the Baptist Health Foundation of San Antonio, 
the Bear County Department of Community Resources, Kronkowski Charitable Foundation, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, San Antonio Metro Health Department, and United Way of San Antonio and Bear County. So for that, we applaud you and thank you very much. I'd also like to thank and recognize the leadership behind the health assessment and the community health improvement plan process. Um, so if you're here, if you'll please stand. First, Dr. Steve Blanchard, a professor of sociology at Our Lady of the Lake University. <laughs> Dr. Anil Mangla, chief Ep epidemiologist and director of for infectious disease and immunizations programs with San Antonio Metro Health Department. Ms. Palmira Ariano, Vice President of Public Relations and Communications for Methodist Healthcare System. <laughs> Ms. Pilar Oates, our Community at Large member. <laughs> Ms. Charlene Doria Ortiz, Program Manager, Bear County Ryan White Program. <laughs> Dr. Robert Ferrer, U University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, Department of Family and Community Medicine. Dr. Laura McKiernan, Associate Professor, San Antonio Regional Campus, UT School of Public Health, and Director of Now Data. And last but not least, not least uh, Charlotte Ann Lucas, Managing Director of Now Cast Essay. And then a special thanks, of course, to our research partners and colleagues with Health Resources in Action, who we'll hear more about soon, Abby Atkins and Jennifer Harriet. We'd also like to thank our media partner, MD News, for their generous support and in-kind donation of articles in their magazine throughout the year and into next year. Thank you, MD News, for providing us that valuable support of media exposure. So I just wanted to recap and say again that this is an effort that is not done just by the board of directors, not just done by the health collaborative, but really it takes all of these different um, individuals and of course your partnership and your continued um, support in order to be able to provide a quality health assessment that each of you can use and that each of you can take on as an action plan move in, moving into a community health improvement plan. So without further um, uh, presentations, I'd like to actually go ahead and introduce our very first speaker. I have the honor of presenting to you um, Senator Van Der Poot. Senator, if you'd like to go ahead and come on up. Senator Leticia Van Der Poot has been a, a practicing pharmacist since 1980. She represents a large portion of San Antonio and Bear County. A former five-term state uh, representative. She has represented Texas Sa State Senate District 26 since 1999. From 2003 to 2011, she served as the chair of the Texas Senate Democratic Caucus. On January 8, 2013, she was unanimously elected by her colleagues to serve as President Pro Tem of the Texas State's 83rd regular session. On May 4, 2013, she was sworn in as governor for a day. And after the 2013 legislative session, she was named the, the, to Texas Monthly's 10 Best Legislators list. Prior to serving in the Texas legislature, Leticia Van Der Poot worked as a pharmacist in mental health clinics and a hospital and her grandfather's pharmacy, the Botanica Guadalupana, before purchasing her own business, the Loma Park Pharmacy and Medical Clinic. Please welcome Senator Leticia Van Der Poot. Good morning, buenos dias. I am very, very proud to be here this morning. Probably because uh, my native San Antonio, my Bear County, has always been so collaborative. As an itty bitty practicing pharmacist in the late 70s, okay, my age is public record, so it's all right. <laughs> there were people right here in this room who reached out to me because of my practice setting in San Antonio's West Side. And they wanted to find out different information about how my patients were using los tecitos, las hierbas medicinales, those herbal medicines. They wanted to find out in our area of need how many folks came in and wanted to purchase 
syringes, but did not have a prescription for insulin, but desperately wanted to get clean. They asked me how my seniors, my personas de tercer edad, were utilizing their medications. Because remember, that was before, way before Medicare Part D with prescription medications. And those of you in this room, you know how you fulfilled my own professional knowledge by working collaboratively way before I ever entered the Texas legislature. And why is it so important to us to reach out to those who are actually working with patients, working with people in the community? It's because our health is the most valuable thing that we have. I mean, think about it. There are other cultures that when, when you lift a drink, you say cheers. But in San Antonio, right, you lift a drink, it's salud. It's to your health. That gift of health is not just predisposed genetically. That gift of health is nurtured by the healthy environments that we live in. The amount of fresh fruits and vegetables that we can buy the predeterminants that are set sometimes by the level of poverty in our communities. It is about walkable communities. It's why it's so important that at the city level that somebody in the zoning commission has a public health background because we want communities to promote activity and walking. And why do we take statistics in the first place? Is it because it's interesting to know those facts? about our mortality, morbidity, infant health, obesity. Is it just important to know that? No. The reason we focus on the data is to see where we can improve, where we can move forward. In the legislature, very early on, meeting with a group of people here, we were concerned about the number of child deaths. And so I introduced a bill that would have a child fatality review team, uh, interdisciplinary, to review each unexplained child death. And folks in the legislature, my colleagues said, Leticia, that's so horrible. Why, why do you want to go over when a family has already lost a precious child? Why would you want to? I mean, why would we want to find out? And the answer is pretty simple. It's not so that we focus on the death or the tragedy. It's so we can focus strategies on how to keep them alive. And because of that, the data that was collected was very important. In Bear County, we knew that as soon as the data was concerned that we had a higher incidence of children who were killed or had horrible outcomes in motor vehicle accidents because either they weren't using child seat or they weren't using them properly. And so the United Way with this health collaborative went on an active program to teach parents and grandparents how to put children safely in a car seat. And our hospitals all made sure that every infant that left their facility was in a baby car seat, an infant car seat. And look at the data, remarkable. And so concentrating on the data is very important. But can it just be the hospitals? Absolutely not. Can it just be the healthcare practitioners? Absolutely not. Or the elected leaders, as much power as we think we have, it is the power of those that sit on all of our not-for-profit boards that really make the vibrancy of the policy making come together so that we have good outcomes. That's what's real important. I'm proud to be a pharmacist here in San Antonio. In fact, a little later on, Today, I will be at Davila Pharmacy again on San Antonio's west side. And it is a joy for me to be there. I get to interact with patients. But also, it gives me a perspective as a policymaker that I couldn't get anywhere else. I look forward to that collaboration on a daily basis with discharge, um, I guess, case managers from the hospitals that call because 
we're going to have one of our patients discharge, and they need everything to be able to remain healthy. I get to talk to doctor's offices and physicians, and not just here in San Antonio, because of the place that I work really has a niche on special needs children. It's not unusual for me to be talking to a physician at Parkland Hospital, and the patient lives in Marshall, Texas, because we take care of children with metabolic disorders or cystic fibrosis, cerebral palsy. And so on a daily basis, I get to do that. But what is so exciting for me is to see my community come together when they have the data, leaving all the egos outside, which sometimes can be difficult, coming to a table, having the conversation about how do we improve the health of the people who live in this great county. Not how do we improve health care, how do we improve health. And that has a strong birth in public health. Why do we have immunization programs? Why is it important for us to make sure that not just infants complete all their shots by two, but that all of the folks who are able to or are at risk make sure that they get their flu shots, their pneumonia shots, and all the other array? Why is it important? Because it increases that productivity. It reduces health care costs for all of us. But the real payouts are not at the corporate board tables or the not-for-profit tables or at commissioner's court or city council or in the legislature. The real payout is at the kitchen table with families. When they can live a life of dignity, when they can live healthy lives, then we all benefit. And so I want to thank all the partners today for the beauty and the vibrancy and the necessity of understanding the data and coming together and making use of it. The other day I met an incredible young lady and she's only 13 and I want to leave you what she said. She said, life is like a camera. You focus on what's important, capture the good times, develop from the negatives, and if it doesn't work out, take another shot. And that's what our community does. It comes together, it focuses on what's really important. While we're doing that, we want to have a great time, and nobody celebrates like San Antonio. And then understanding our negatives so that we can improve them. And then working together. And guess what? If it doesn't work out, we try again. Congratulations to all of the partners, to everybody who's here together. With this knowledge, we'll improve the health of the people who live in Bear County. Muchísimas gracias. little bench. Yay. <laughs> I was worried I was going to fall off. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Senator Vanderpute. Um, she's spoken at our community health improvement plan before, and every single time, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's, it's just a great inspiration to have her here. So um, I'd like to uh, take the time to introduce our next presenter, um, someone who um, in my small time with the Health Collaborative, I've learned so much about and have been very honored to be um, a partner with. Um, Judge Nelson Wolf has represented Bear County in various political offices since 1971 when he was elected to the Texas House of Representatives. After that, he was elected to the Texas State Senate in 1973, the San Antonio City Council in 1987, and he served as mayor of the city of San Antonio from 1991 to 1995. He currently serves as Bear County Judge, a position he was appointed to in 2001 and has since been elected to three times, since recent, uh, most recently in November of 2010. He is the only, uh, he's only the second person in more than a century to serve as both mayor of San Antonio and Bear County Judge, with his colleagues on the commissioner uh, on the commissioner's court, and in the city of San Antonio, Judge Wolf has worked to promote greater economic development in Bear County. We know him best as an advocate for health. 
through the Department of Community Resources, the judge and our commissioners have supported the efforts of many community-based organizations. And I've had the privilege to sit in general sessions where many agencies have received funds from the county to continue the great work of community, a champion for health in our city. Please welcome Honorable J Judge County, County Judge Wolf. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for the great work that you're doing along with uh, Dr. Steve Blanchard and pulling everybody together on this health collaborative. Uh, I really believe we're beginning to make a difference in San Antonio and Bear County uh, with the great outreach that all of you are doing across this community. And we're beginning to see some aspects of health getting a little bit better, whether it's obesity or teenage pregnancy, we see some declines in that. But we know we have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us and some issues facing us today that are absolutely critical uh, to bringing uh, good health care uh, to people in our community. I want to thank Aurora Sanchez, who heads up our community resources and the tremendous work that she has done with this group in pulling us, all, of us, all of us together and leading Bear County to address uh, major health care issues. I want to thank George Hernandez. George is here today with University Hospital. I believe our greatest responsibility is health care in the Bear County Hospital District uh, that we appoint the board members to, uh, prove their budget and do their tax rate. But if these are the guys, the board that we appoint and George Hernandez are the ones that are leading this great institution into new waters that have never been there before. The new building they just opened downtown uh, servicing more and more people in the inner city. The new uh, hospital that they'll be opening on the, at the medical center in April of next year, 187 days according to Lenny, that that will open a million square feet, a new trauma tower, a number of different ways that we're going to be helping uh, through the hospital district uh, to bring greater uh, health services uh, to our community, regardless of your income, regardless of where you're from, we're going to take care of you. And to Senator Van De Pute, she's been a guiding light for a long, long time in the, in the Texas Senate in terms of helping us, whether it's children or other health care issues. She's been there for us, and I want to thank her uh, very much for the great work uh, that she has done. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things that I think are important that we need to be addressing as we look ahead. We need to continue to plow money, as we have in the last uh, 10 years since I've been there, into the court systems that treat people rather than punish people. Uh, we've now been able, uh, between our drug courts and mental health courts, uh, to graduate some 1,000 people that were in the criminal justice si system, and instead of sending them to jail, putting them back out in society with stronger support from all of the organizations that help them uh, uh, across this community. And the judges have been a great uh, effort in doing that. The mental diversion program Rather than ha hauling someone to jail, we take them to try to treat them. I think the court systems and the money that we're putting there toward treatment rather than incarceration is beginning to have a, a good impact in San Antonio, and we need to continue to fund that and to keep to and make sure that it works. Even within the county manager's department, we're focusing on mental health issues beyond just what we're doing, what we're doing in the courts. Uh, I, I, I continue to believe uh, that the greatest uh, effort that we need to make is in prevention. And we're beginning to have some impact there. Uh, we're providing more and more recreational facilities. The Bear County Commissioner's Court spent $85 million building 13 regional amateur sports parks. In fact, I'll be going to one when I leave here, at the big swim, swinner, swim center that we did in Northside uh, that's bringing some great, great uh, kids opportunities uh, to participating in a lifelong sport. I can't think of any other sport that would probably keep you healthy all your life than if you were to go swim uh, throughout, throughout your lifetime. The other sports parks, what we did on the river going south, if you haven't been on the mission reach of the river, you're missing a great, great, great opportunity. Uh, it's the largest ecological restoration of a river anywhere, an urban river anywhere in the United States. Get on your bike, walk, jog, uh, whatever you want to do, get on that river and enjoy yourself and get some, and get some great exercise. Go along the creeks that uh, uh, former Mayor Howard Peake took the lead on in creating bike paths and walking paths. More opportunities 
in San Antonio has ever had to get out and get some recreation. You got to do that, and I think it's important. The schools that have cut out uh, programs for physical exercise, that, that's a tragedy, an absolute tragedy. And they need to do more to allow children in their schools to get some sort of exercise where they walk around the school ground or whatever they do. And of course, we're doing a better job on trying to get over uh, the issues of what people ought to be eating. I was in that business for a long, long time in the natural foods business. And uh, I can't think of any other important aspect, as was mentioned earlier, fruits and vegetables and eat. You've got to pound on the prevention, prevention issues. And I believe, I believe, we have not taken enough advantage of information that is all over the internet regarding health. I like doctors, but I also like to do a little double check on them. <laughs> and when there's a little diagnosis, I go to that internet and there's so many tremendous sites on that internet that give you unbelievable information about any sort of symptom you may have or any diagnosis and it, it, I think we have not made uh, a good access of the information that we can provide o over the internet. So I think if we'll work on that, I know the university hospital is doing more in that area. We all need to do more, er more work in, in the area of prevention. And let me just close on one issue. And it, I must say I got upset uh, just driving uh, in here I was listening to NPR, and there was a congressman, I believe he was from Utah, uh, bashing uh, the uh, <coughs> Affordable Health Care Act and saying how horrible it is and how bad it is, not even giving it a chance to perform, driving people away before they even have the opportunity to see what's available to them, scaring them. Uh, we're in the throes of a very, very important period of time in health care. And I know we've had, the federal government's had some computer glitches, and I know there's been some, you know, anger with respect to that. But we have till March on this first drive, and there'll be time after that also to give people an opportunity to sign up on this program. And if their household incomes are about 80000 or less, they're going to get a tax break, and they're going to be able to access uh, health care. Yes, it's complicated, but tell me any health care package that isn't complicated. It's complicated at Bear County and every private uh, company around here. So we've got to really continue to focus on that issue of, of getting them the information. Hopefully it's going to be something that's going to be good for them, and hopefully they will sign up. The next few months are going to determine politically, I think, across the nation of whether this is going to work or not. And whether you believe in it or not, we need to give it its best, best chance. And its best chance is trying to get as much information as we can to everybody. I know we're all working on that. Uh, University Hospital in Georgia are acting as the clearinghouse uh, for that effort. And you, you, did you get your website up yet, George? Yeah, we got the website up that gives you great information on it. It's a, it's a great website. So, we all working hard for that. I think out of 55,000 people we have on CareLink, I believe we think around 17, 18, 20,000 are eligible for these programs. So all of us have got to continue to work on that. We've all been pushing it. Mayor Castro has been out front uh, encouraging everybody to try to take advantage of this. And let me just say one more quick thing. Uh, that's important. But there's something else that's very important that Texas passed up, and that was the uh, expanded Medicaid program, Medicare program. Uh, as you know, we're at the bottom of the trough uh, on health care, and we seem to be proud of it uh, around the state. Uh, and as every state that participates in expansion of Medicaid, more and more of their citizens are going to be helped. Less and less of their citizens are going to be without insurance. What do we got, 27% or so in Bear County alone, 25, 30% in the state? So as we move along, we're going to look worse and worse. Now, I guess there's some folks in the state that think that's real good. Well, it's not so good when people are dying and people are getting sick and they can't get health care. So we've got to continue to push for the expansion of Medicare, Medicaid. It won't be till the next session of the legislature. Uh, if we don't eventually move into that, this state will continue to have people 
that are getting sick, that are waiting too long to get treated, that could have treated at a less expensive cost, but instead they wait and they wait because they don't have the money, they don't have the insurance, and then when they go, they're terribly sick and it costs everybody a lot more money uh, to treat them. So I would say those two things are gonna be real important over the next five, 10 years, uh, whether we're gonna really significantly improve the health care in Bear County in the state of Texas. Again, thank you for everything you're doing. Rebecca is gonna be talking to you in a minute. She's been a breath of fresh air on the city council and we've had a great time uh, working together and we appreciate the work that she's doing also. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Our next presenter um, is uh, here by way of Mayor Pratem by uh, Mayor Castro. Um, it's, uh, on May 2000, uh, 2011, excuse me, 2013, Rebecca Villagran was elected to serve City Council District 3. Rebecca is proud to be um, from a family whose history extends over 200 years in San Antonio and South Texas and has a long legacy of service to the community she currently serves. She resides in the same neighborhood where she grew up while attending St. Leo's Catholic School and Providence High School. After high school, Rebecca attended Texas State University where she received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Geography, Urban and Regional Planning. Desiring to make, a, make an impact in San Antonio city government, she returned to her hometown after graduating from college to work as a city council aide. Her focus was working with neighborhood associations and constituent services. Aside from being directly involved with the city government, Rebecca also has experience working with community organizations and volunteering for important causes. She served the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as Vice President of External Affairs and worked as the Director of Government and Community Relations for the Mexican Americans Thinking Together or MAT. Volunteerism has played a central role in Rebecca's career path. Affected by the events of September 11th, Rebecca volunteered in New York City at Ground Zero. She also worked as an international missionary in Spain and because of the issues concerning women and children have always been important to her, she has served on, this, on the board of the directors for uh, Voices for Children, San Antonio, and was appointed to the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women. Rebecca earned a master's degree in public administration from St. Mary's University and has since returned to her alma mater to teach as an adjunct professor in political science. She also assists in maintaining her family's small business established by her parents in 1986 in District 3. Please welcome Mayor Pratam, Ms. Rebecca Villagran. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you so much for having me here. And um, it's my honor to serve as Mayor Pro Tem sending greetings from Mayor Julian Castro and uh, our city council. I wanted to, to thank you because healthcare is a very, very dear, um, very close to my heart personally, knowing that in District 3, <clears throat> personally with my family, my father passed away about two years ago from uh, cancer, but then also uh, he dealt with Parkinson's disease too. And seeing how that played a part and totally transforms families. And knowing how many people have to come and be a part, partners with you, when one family member is sick and how everybody comes into part, into play. And I see here with this collaborative, you all are a living example of everyone coming to the table to help a family uh, go through healthcare issues. So I wanna thank you personally for that. And I come here representing the Mayor and City Council not to politicize this issue. Um, although we hear a lot of talk on NPR and other things, as we all know, but to acknowledge the importance of a data report, this data, comprehensive data that is in fa affecting all of our community and to use that data and see how we will move forward together. I want to acknowledge the logo, your logo, with, with the collaborative. All of these pieces, all of these puzzle pieces play an important part 
of looking at the bigger picture. We can't move forward without the other. And this, again, is something that we want to acknowledge and let you know that we're standing here together. The report, this report, this assessment, is both our checkup and our diagnosis of how we are to move together as a community. I know in District 3, as Judge Wolf said, it, uh, this Saturday was the official opening of the Mission Reach. And I know for him and for myself, what a joy it was to see people out there with their dogs, with their bikes, and on kayaks. If you all haven't kayaked on the river yet, I want to highly recommend that. You don't need to go to Austin to kayak anymore. You can stay in San Antonio. And, but it was families, not just one or two individuals. We are now seeing families going out together and exercising together because of the mission reach and because of these sport complexes that we've worked together to move forward. Now, I am glad to be a part of that. And one other issue that is very important in District 3 and in all the city are our seniors. And we see a lot of our seniors that um, some are being ignored, but some just need to be brought in and checked up on. We have a lot of senior centers, about eight in District 3. We have a lot of seniors who go without food, and that goes without nutrition. And then in the summers, they don't have enough money to pay their bills, so they don't turn on the air conditioner. And they're not getting checked on. This is a very, very important issue, not just for me, but for other members of the council. And I know for all of our uh, elected representatives. So I am glad to be here to work together with you. And please know that we are standing together with you because we have a lot of issues that we have to work on together. And I'm glad that this report is going to be just a guide for us to move forward. This is not political because this is about the people that we serve. And on behalf of the mayor and council, I want you to know that we are standing here with you to move together to work towards solutions on these issues. It, we know it's not going to be overnight, but I know we're going to move forward. And I see a good doctor here with the, uh, the Metro Health District. So thank you for being here and all the reports that you all are doing. Um, that we need to, to move forward and, and tackle, too. So again, thank you for your time. I look forward to staying in conversation. And congratulations, Elizabeth, Dr. Uh, Blanchard. Congratulations on all the work. Thank you. OK, well, after listening to all of our wonderful leadership, I'm very, very proud to now introduce our leadership, my leadership, um, my board of directors and my, uh, my board chair specifically um, to provide you the information of the community health assessment. So um, Steve, you'll come up. Um, Steve again is the uh, health collaborative board chair and our health assessment data committee chair. Um, Dr. Steve Blanchard and Abby Adkins, Director of Research and Evaluation for Health Resources in Action, will be presenting our 2013 Community Health Assessment Report. Good morning. Uh, forgive me, a little while ago when I made the opening remark, I didn't introduce myself. You probably wondered who that fellow was, but uh, forgive me for that. Um, we have the, uh, thank you. I have to practice with this. The right button right advances it. There we go. Thank you. Um, before we begin, I'd like to make a, a comment, um, somewhat, I guess, uh, kind of related to what we're about to do, but as an uh, introductory, uh, say, shall we say, preface. Elizabeth has mentioned the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Roadmaps to Health, and she'll talk a little more about that later in the hour, our, our uh, presentation here today. Um, as you, some of you may know, San Antonio is among the finalists for the prize of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's um, Roadmaps to Health. 
And I think uh, that recognizes, uh, Robert Wood Johnson recognizes how well we are doing and that we are on a, what, uh, a successful roadmap uh, to community health. Um, in the news release, uh, when that was announced last week, I was quoted as saying that uh, we are rapidly becoming one of the healthiest communities in the nation, living in the heart of one of the unhealthiest states, or as the judge so aptly put it, in the trough. Um, but I think what we'll see, and, um, and we have seen over the course of the assessments, that that momentum is growing and growing and growing um, to be uh, one of the healthiest communities in the nation. That's evidentiary. I'm not just making a, a declarative statement there. Um, we do have momentum, and we've seen that in the consecutive assessments, um, and yet we have challenges. We will talk about features of the momentum and how we're improving in health, yet as we must, we have to talk about the challenges that um, keep the acceleration of that momentum uh, much slower than what we would like. We know, for example, that uh, wealth disparity is widening, not just, it is in this county, but of course we know that it is across, uh, across the nation as well. And we know that health disparity tracks wealth disparity. To the extent we become more disparate in wealth, we become more disparate in health. Um, there is an increase in healthcare services, and that's good in our community. Um, and yet there are a significant number, perhaps as many as a third, that don't have health insurance. Although, as um, the judge again was saying, there is a possible, there is a very good solution for that already in front of us. Um, but we do have um, a um, healthcare, healthcare services increase. Um, I think, the th to me, the salient, there's always a salient finding. Uh, I think the salient finding for me this year is not so much health-related as it was last time, as it is um, the sense of community engagement, the sense of community cohesion. When I talk about community, I'm not talking about San Antonio or Barrett County, it's just community. All of us inside, if you will, the boundary of Barrett County. Um, there's a strong sense of community engagement and community, uh, community uh, cohesion. And as uh, the senator said, we're collaborative. We are a collaborative community, and that's reflected in those of us that are here at the table. Individuals, groups, institutions, organizations, uh, governmental entities, we're willing to come to the table, sit at a common table, and look at the problem and come to common uh, solutions. And I think that is um, a good place for us to be. And um, so having said that as sort of a preface, let's see how this story unfolds. Um, uh, in the story uh, aspect of the 2013 assessment. Um, these are what we want to do today for uh, the present uh, objectives. Talk a little bit about the goals and methodology of the 2013. Uh, discuss key findings and themes of the assessment. Um, identify some potential uses and channels to ex access and identify opportunities to involve in the 2014 CHIP. I think from my standpoint, the chip is important, it's the CHA. That's what we call it, the community health assessment is the CHA, and the community health improvement is the CHIP. So we talk about the CHA chip, CHA chip, from the CHA to the chip, to the CHA to the chip, to the CHA to the chip. It is a sequence, and they are very interrelated and complementary, and we want to uh, talk about the chip before we can, that is the action plan. Um, and then, um, I think, uh, Talk a little bit here and I'll give a, a, some comments about the Health Collaborative. Um, in 1997, Elizabeth and I spoke a little bit about this before. We were a small group of hospitals um, getting together to undertake a, uh, the status of community health. Individual hospitals decided to collaborate, uh, four or five hospitals, and then became a 501c3 in 2000. Uh, collaboration of hospitals and uh, with a mission to improve community health. And now in 2013, it's an extensive array of stakeholders at the table. We have many uh, aspects of the healthcare infrastructure, not just hospitals, but funding and organizations like WellMed and, and others. And we have uh, the medical school and academic institutions, a number of, uh, just a broader array of stakeholders, which I think reflects the growth of interest in the community health assessment, has that, that breadth of growth 
as now reflected on the board. And now we've done five community health assessments, this 2013 being the, the third, uh, the, the fifth. From 1998 to present, there are some key trends, I think, in what we have done that we should um, address and, in a sense, congratulate ourselves for. We have gone from a collaborative effort of hospitals uh, to assess the health status to a county-wide community stakeholder effort, reflected you know, to a large extent by what we see here in front of us, all of us to uh, together. Um, and we have gone from a traditional cross-sectional profile, which is very traditional, uh, cross-sectional profile of health status based on rates and proportions and that sort of thing, to what we will characterize as the upstream model. Uh, what is upstream that gives rise to that um, um, healthcare profile, uh, looking at behavioral and contextual influences that on the downstream profile. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, we've gone from essentially administrative level data, um, vital statistics, which has always been instrumental and key to the development of any profile. We have about as complete and accurate a vital statistics system as anywhere in the world, so why wouldn't we rely on it? And to an assessment where the community voice is involved, from primary data collection or using secondary data to primary data collection uh, based on community voice. And then lastly, we've gone from, in the early days, from I guess we would uh, call it an essentially shelf document, a reference document, uh, to an assessment with an action plan, the community health improvement plan, which is um, something that we'll talk about towards the end of uh, the hour Abby and I are doing. Upstream, downstream. Now, I think this is an important way to think about this, because when we look at the profile, we want to know, why did this happen? Why do we have this profile? What can we do to change it? And so one way that we have think, thought about characterizing this, and it's a, a growing way of thinking about it in public health and healthcare infrastructure and healthcare sector generally, is to go upstream to behaviors and then go on upstream to context. So in the um, downstream, we have the health profile built on vital statistics. And uh, the flow is to your right. <laughs> and then um, we look upstream to see what might have given rise to that profile. And we see that upstream are health-related behaviors. The, the behavior risk factor survey, self-survey that the CDC does is a principal source of data for characterizing behaviors in, uh, across the country. But we use heavily here in the county, uh, in our community, for um, characterizing behavior upstream of the profile. And then the idea is that what gives rise to those pro, uh, the profile of uh, behaviors or the features of behavior is the upstream context, the context of neighborhood. Here we look at socioeconomic factors. We look at a number of characteristics of neighborhoods themselves, the infrastructure of neighborhoods. And so that when we're downstream at the profile, we look upstream to the behaviors and we look farther upstream to the context. Now, of course, the behavioral profile gives us a chance for a program, programmatic intervention to assist community to change um, its uh, behaviors, health-related behaviors, and the con contextual um, influence on the downstream profile gives an opportunity for policy at the um, level of the municipal, municipal level and at the county level. The methodology for the 2013 community health assessment um, we have, uh, we create the health outcome and behavior profile, that's just what this report is. It has upstream and downstream components. Um, it includes community voice, as I spoke about a minute ago. We began 13, 14, 17 years ago with administrative data. Now I'd have to say the weight, the weight of the um, report is on community voice. Community voice through focus groups, key informant, uh, key informant interviews, and extensive community meetings where individuals get together, community members get together, the neighbors get together, and talk about issues of health in front of them and what might be those strategies to improve health. And then we have data and communication partners, many of them, but I wanted to mention these uh, two principal ones. Uh, uh, community Information Now is a uh, member of the National Neighborhood Partnership Indicator uh, Partnership. Uh, that is sponsored by the um, Urban Institute, and it has two parts to it that are very uh, integral to what we do with the assessment. Now, data, which is housed at the um, uh, uh, health, uh, School of Public Health, excuse me, 
And um, for example, R. McKeeran, who's, I'm not sure she's here, but was identified a little earlier, uh, brings data to the community meetings to stimulate discussion uh, on data that describe that particular neighborhood. And then NowCast SA, who is present here, CA and her crew, they live stream uh, community meetings and create opportunities for virtual focus groups online. So it, it broadens out just what we're doing in a neighborhood to the communi a community-wide uh, focus group. And of course, always the Metropolitan Health District. Uh, they are on the board, as is the county. Uh, Metropolitan Health District is a source of a lot of data or provides data from the Burfus and they are the holders of the vital statistics. So they are critical to any undertaking we do in the way of community health assessment. Um, so let's take a, a few minutes and look at uh, some demographic features. I think one way we can think of this are features of the neighborhood context. Um, there are about half a dozen slides here to kind of get ourselves started. Um, eight sub uh, some things that are new for 2013. Eight subsectors based on zip codes. Now this is an important piece. Uh, Previously, what we've been doing is aggregate uh, uh, census tracts when we would do those neighborhood um, sectors, if you remember that from previous reports. We're, we've converted this year to uh, zip codes because while hardly anyone knows their census tract, most everyone knows their zip code. And while hardly anyone reports health on the basis of census tract, except maybe the Metropolitan Health that can do that sort of thing, uh, most everyone, hospitals included, report data uh, by zip code. So that makes the information more interpretable by, uh, interpretable by everyone, but it does cause an interruption in the time series because from what we had 2010 and previous was based on a little bit different definition of geography and now we're doing zip codes. Um, we haven't quite figured out a comparability ta table to take you cleanly from 2010 to 2013, but we will solve that problem, I'm sure. But in the, from now on, we'll be on, at the zip code level. Um, We've incorporated uh, indicators uh, identified in the 2012 chip. When we do the CHA, we want to see what the indicators are that are, represent the chip to see how well the chip is doing. So one of the principal functions of the CHA is to assess the chip. Right after we finish this, the, uh, the steering committee for the 2013 assessment becomes the steering committee for the 2014 chip. And we'll, we'll redesign or rethink the, the chip based on uh, the 2013 outcomes. So that CHA chip connection is very, very vital. And we, are in, we have incorporated indicators uh, that are important, and health indicators that are important for SA 2020 to help to broaden out the sector participation in the, in the community health assessment and the chip. Uh, we have hyperlinks to additional data sources that you'll see in the report which we haven't done before, capitalizing more on the highly interactive um, electronics around us. And um, an available in search format. I don't know if Tim is here. Uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that you'll be able to interact with our report is you'll be able to go up, and I think we've got a demonstration here somewhere, be up, go up into, say, the executive summary. If you see a table that you like, you can retrieve it easily and uh, incorporate it into a report. And of course, it has all the sorts of attributions that are required for that sort of activity. Okay. Um, these are, this is the map that you can see now. It looks slightly different geographically because it's aggregates of zip codes. Um, so what are the key findings? Uh, this is the features of the neighborhood context that I'll address before Abby gets into some of the more uh, health-specific findings. Now, I was going to ask you a question before I pop this up, <laughs> uh, and I will with the next slides. But the question was, how do you think the population has changed over the last few years? And you'd probably say, I doubt you would say, well, it's in decline. Um, and you would be right, of course, it's, uh, that it's not in decline, that it's on the increase. And here you can see that it is. Um, and natural fertility, uh, more de uh, births than deaths, immigration from other uh, regions of Texas in the country, and of course from Mexico and other regions of uh, areas of Latin America. And so what this means, of course, when we think about it in healthcare, is that the need, indeed, the demand for healthcare is growing, uh, commensurate with the growth in population, something we have to think about. And we're doing it because we're increasing healthcare services. I meant to ask the other question here. Um, age distribution, I was going to ask you, how do you think we're distributed in age groups? And you might say, well, we're very young, and you would be right. We are, we are young. 
I, the natural fertility would suggest that. We have some total fertility rates that are higher in some populations than others. But the important uh, feature of this, I think, is if you look at how, uh, how the, the age, which you can see that group, uh, which I count myself, uh, 65 plus, um, I'm trying to read that from here, which I don't see quite so well. But you can see that bar on the left, there's a 19.9, goes to 23.1, 23.4, and then the, those groups above that are increasing. You can see that we are actually an aging community, uh, which is um, also true of the country at large, true of many countries around the world, really. And so that, that speaks to the need for more geriatric medicine, uh, geriatric psychology, uh, psychiatry rather, uh, more geriatric responses to our um, health care than we might have thought about in the past. Uh, racial and ethnic diversity, now this one is probably pretty, pretty known to you. If I were to ask you are we, how diverse are we, uh, or what is the principal uh, feature of diversity, um, and say which ethnic or racial group, you probably would say Hispanic is a prominent group, and you would be right. I'm giving you the answers, and that's okay. Um, here you can see along the bottom are the uh, sectors that we talked about. Texas on the far left, the second from the left is Bear County. And here you can see the, the, the bar chart distribution of, of uh, percentage or proportion Hispanic. And you can see that we are probably at least a third again Hispanic in the statewide. We're the second bar from the left, Bear County. And then you see the near east side and then of course the southwest is in the center and uh, the near west side and the southeast. These are not surprising geographic distributions to you, I'm sure. Uh, we're familiar with that. West side, east side, south side, north side are familiar uh, demographic or geographic, um, shall we say, social containers that we've talked about for many years, and, and here it is. And then um, the, the next level are the non-Hispanic white, and you can see quite a bit of geographic diversity there. And then the next is the um, African American, and it's not so easy to see, at least from my eyes, but you can see that there is um, diversity there in a geographic distribution, and then there's always the other, and um, which in, our, in our, uh, our community is a very small percentage in the, in the group. So you can see there's quite a bit of ethnic diversity, racial and ethnic diversity in our community, and it is geographically diverse as well. Uh, and as we know also, health, health disparities, if we can put it that way, also tracks uh, racial and ethnic diversity. So there are certain features of health that are more characteristic of some of these populations than for others, and Abby will speak to that. And so that if we see that they are geographically distributed, then some areas of the, of the uh, community will be more characterized by certain health features than will um, others. Um, educational attainment of indiv individuals. Um, I'm not doing very well at asking the questions. Abby and I said we would do this to promote interaction, and I'm not doing that very well. Uh, but anyway, um, here you can see that, again, we have quite a lot of diversity, and unfortunately, it's not quite as good as we would like. It's maybe uh, uh, got too much prominence in it. If you look at, uh, we have somewhere around just under 50% of our population that is um, at the high school level or below. And uh, you can imagine that that tracks uh, socioeconomic status, it tracks, to some extent, it tracks the um, racial and ethnic diversity, and, um, and of course, has its also geographic correspondence. Um, and you can see those distributions, how it's diverse. You can see the far north side on the right, very different from those in the center in terms of educational attainment, particularly if you think of the college level. Um, and the Next one is mean household income. This is not surprising either. Um, and again, it follows the uh, distributions that we have seen. We are very disparate geographically, or very diverse and disparate. Disparate in health geographically and um, diverse in our demographic features. The poverty rates for families with children, as you can see, is um, very variable. <laughs> Uh, the far right is slow, and in the center it's high, the near east side. Um, what you see is, uh, for no blue bars uh, to the left of Texas and Bexar County, 
is a consequence of our change to uh, zip codes where we don't have that uh, information to give you. Um, but nonetheless, you can see the uh, variability across the geography. And this is a, a, a representation of that growing wealth disparity I was speaking of earlier. Now, having said that, and I spoke to the, the sense of community engagement, the sense of cohesion, it doesn't matter where we are in the community voice. If we're at the, um, if we're in the mayor's office or speaking to the judge, uh, County Judge Wolf speaking to the judge, um, and, or speaking to Mayor Julian Castro, or if we are anywhere that we are, out in the community talking in focus groups, community meetings on the west side, um, there is conversations about a sense of identity with the community uh, that we live in. Um, we know that we're diverse, we have seen that. There's a strength in that, uh, in that we can learn from one another. One culture can learn from another. Um, so that's, a, that's something that people talk about. We are, we are a diverse group and we can learn. We each have strategies and we can learn from one another. Uh, the sense of community cohesion, it doesn't matter where you are in one of those geographic areas. When you sit down with people in the community, they talk about how connected we are with the community at large. A strong sense of community cohesion. We know, as uh, uh, both the senator and the judge spoke about, an increasing physical activity environment. That's reflected to some extent in the findings that Abby will talk about. Um, the reach, bicycles, uh, walks. I lived near Woodlawn Lake, used to. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I could walk around Woodlawn Lake and not worry about bumping into anybody. And now, at 7 o'clock in the evening, you have to be very careful. There are people out there running, they're walking, or they're just paseándose, but they're out there moving their legs and having a good time. And that's an example or an illustration of how well we're doing, and that's the momentum. People come out of the neighborhoods into parks. Or if they've got lighted neighborhoods, they get out on the sidewalks and walk. It's good stuff. And if they can, they get on a bike and they go right around. Or they take a bus and go walk along the river. Healthcare services that I mentioned a minute ago are on the rise. So we're already beginning to recognize the need out there and the healthcare infrastructure in the county, uh, in, in the county and the community is um, responding to that. Um, I think in, uh, before turning it over to Abby, I, I want to say that the strength of this community is its collaboration. And not in the big C of the collaborative board, uh, that's just a small piece of who we are in the community, but we're a collaborative community. That's a good way to characterize us. People who come together in organizations like today and sit around a common table, look at the good things in front of us and say, great, and then look at the things that we have to work on and say, great. We've got the energy and the will and the sense of community to do it. We are a collaborative community, and to me that is the salient characteristic that, from my personal standpoint, that came out of this 2013 assessment. So good for us. Um, and now Abby. Oh, don't you worry, he'll be back. Um, so Steve has talked about all of the upstream items um, that are in the community health assessment when we look at this upstream downstream model. Um, and here in Bear County, you've got a growing population that's predicted to grow 7 to 10% over the next 10 years. You have an increasing Hispanic population. By the way, those two points, I live in New York, we lost the Senate seat. I mean, we lost a uh, House seat and several of them actually to Texas. And um, we have 40% of the population that has a high school or less um, degree and um, a diversity of income across the, across the county as well as some increasing uh, rates of poverty. But we also have a community that values its diversity, that has strong co social cohesion, um, and we've already seen some improvements. Um, I have the uh, for good fortune um, and the wonderful opportunity of not living here in Bear County, but being able to come back to Bear County and um, see change. I don't live it day to day. Um, so when I come back to Bear County, I'll tell you some of the things that I see right away are I need to build um, on my skills for driving a rental car and negotiating bicyclists on narrow streets. Where I live, you just drive way out and around them. Here, there's not a lot of space to do that. But when I was here in 2009, I didn't see any bicyclists, particularly at night. By the way, you should all be wearing helmets and have on uh, glow-in-the-dark gear. <laughs> um, and now I cannot get out on the street without having to drive around somebody who, who's on a bicycle. That's really exciting. 
Um, I also uh, have listened to, um, we get up and um, spend time in the community in the morning. We go for a run or a walk. There are now many more places that my team and I can do that than, um, than before, and I can't wait to take my kayak out. Sorry, my rental kayak out. Um, so with um, Bear County also has this chip that was developed, so a set of indicators and some ideas on how to improve uh, health in Bear County. Bear County also has SA 2020. What we tried to do with the 2013 report were take those two pieces and bring them together so that we could make this report even more useful by a broader number of people. We're investing the time and the resources in it. We might as well make it useful for you. One of the things we look at when we're looking at the downstream pieces, so this is the traditional community profile piece, and I'll be honest with you right now, you've been sitting here since 8 o'clock in the morning, it's now a little bit after 9, this is the not so entertaining part, this is the boring part, this is the numbers, and I haven't even begun to scrape the tip of this iceberg with these numbers. I encourage you, um, particularly since the federal government is not open, this is the place where you can get some numbers and I'm going to tell you how to get there. Um, we can look at self-reported health status. Um, so people were asked through a phone survey what they thought their health status was. And here in Bear County, um, we see that there's actually um, been a slight decline in good and better health status. Um, there are also some challenges with the way we pull the data and we look at the data and other things that, that have happened. Steve's already noted that we've changed the subsectors within Bear County, so you can't flip back to the 2009 2010 report and compare the same regions. One of the things that the um, Centers for Disease Control has done is change the methodology on the behavior risk factor surveillance survey. And while I can draw a line between 2008 and 2010, the 2012 numbers aren't exactly comparable to the 2010 numbers, so you'll see throughout the report there are a lot of dots with no lines going to them, but that's because uh, they're not comparable, but we wanted you to see um, those numbers on, this, on the same page. So there's, there's been a slight uh, decrease in um, those individuals who are pro, uh, reporting good or better health status. Um, we've also seen a slight increase in the number of the percentage of adults who are actually reporting that in the past month they've had five or more days in which they've had poor physical or mental health status. This, by the way, is also a chip indicator as well as an SA2020 indicator. We can also look at, um, so here's how people feel about their, house, their health, but what's putting them in the hospital? And what's putting them in the hospital are um, disorders re related to um, mental illness and injury and poisoning. Um, so that includes um, straight up poisoning, it includes slipping and falling, um, it includes uh, getting hit um, by a car while you're riding your bike. These numbers here haven't changed much um, between 2009 and 2011. We can also look at what people are dying from and um, in uh, Bear County what people are dying from are cancer and heart disease. Um, those numbers are, as you can see on this chart, noticeably higher than uh, suicide, unintentional injury, diabetes, um, and cancer. I mean, sorry, and diabetes and homicide. Um, with the 2012 uh, CHIP report, and please feel free if I start dropping acronyms left and right to raise your hand and say I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, with the 2012 CHIP report, um, there were five areas that were created um, for, for work. And the next part of this, what we've done is we've taken those five areas and organized the, um, the indicators um, into that piece. The first one is healthy eating and active living. As we talked about by many speakers this morning already, physical activity and healthy eating are critical parts of maintaining good health. Everyone, children and adults, um, benefit from being physically active and eating a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables um, every day. Um, regular physical activity and good nutrition can reduce a person's risk um, for obesity, chronic disease, and make certain health conditions, keep their, certain health conditions from worsening over time. Um, we can look at fruit and vegetable consumption among adults and see that here in Bear County, um, there's just over 20% of adults in 2012 had three or more servings of vegetables every day and uh, just above 10% had three or more servings of fruits. 
When we look at youth, we can see um, from the youth risk behavior uh, survey, we can see that um, in Bear County, um, just over 20% of um, young people, these young people actually are high school students, had five or more servings of fruits and vegetables in, during the past seven days, which is slightly higher than Texas. So also keep in mind when you look at these charts, the top of these charts are at 25%. We got plenty of room to grow here. While we may be doing better than Texas for the young people, there's lots of opportunity here. We can also look at people being physically active. Um, for adults, this is both a um, CHIP and an SA2020 indicator. Um, for adults, we're actually seeing a, a slight decline, um, but it seems to be leveling off with the changes in methodology and with the changes that are going on here in San Antonio, I suspect we're going to see some more changes in these numbers. Um, but when looking at adults who are engaged in activity for exercise, we're looking at somewhere between 72 and 75 percent of adults here in San Antonio. When we look at young people who are engaged um, in activities to be physically active, we see San uh, Bear County staying about the same and uh, Texas declining a little. Um, we also see unique opportunities within the public schools and um, other school systems to look at requirements around physical education, um, particularly at the high school level and how often uh, that is offered and what's the quality that's offered for, for young people. We do have some successes here in San Antonio um, that should continue to be celebrated um, but not ignored in that just because we've had these successes doesn't mean we need to stop doing a lot more work to make sure that we continue on a downward trend. Um, obesity rates for adults in, um, in Bear County um, actually have declined from 2010 to uh, 2012. Um, there are two sets of numbers out there. One is uh, the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey numbers. The others are the CPPW numbers. Um, when you look at the CPPW numbers, you actually see a larger decline um, than the BRFIS numbers. Uh, both of them are valid. Uh, when we look um, at youth numbers, we're seeing a decline in Bear County while we're seeing an increase in Texas. Uh, this, to me, continues to support Steve Blanchard's earlier comment about um, being a healthy city in one of the most unhealthy states. Another area in the chip that we look at is uh, healthy child and family development. Uh, the well-being of mothers, infants, and young children uh, determines the health of the next generation and can help predict the future of public health um, challenges for families, communities, and the health care system. Um, we can look at, um, the CHIP looks at uh, women who are receiving late or no prenatal care. Um, there are some cultural issues here. There is an increase um, in women who are receiving late or no prenatal care. In general, that's, that's definitely a concern and something that needs to be investigated further. Um, however, it also needs to be considered some of the cultural imp uh, implications of this and whether or not um, how families are set up to support um, prenatal care. Um, we do see an increase in births to single mothers. These are single mothers, not teens. Teens are included in here. Um, and we are seeing a slight increase in births to single mothers. Um, we are seeing a um, a uh, general a decrease in or some stability in premature births um, but when you look at it by race and ethnicity uh, you do see that there's a decline in uh, premature births in the uh, black population about the same in the Hispanic population and about the same in the uh, in the white population this is also a chip and an SA 2020 indicator and we do see um, some exciting improvements um, in infant mortality. Um, you can also look at the report. So this is, covers all of Bear County. The report, we can tell you stories by race and ethnicity, um, as well as we can tell you stories by uh, the subsectors uh, within Bear County. Um, so there's a lot more to look at. I'm just giving you a general overview. Another area that came up in the CHIP is the area of safe communities. A safe community is a place in which people and organizations have come together to reduce injury and promote the safety of all residents. Um, this is an opportunity to develop safe neighborhoods by identifying what works locally, 
uh, plan how to replicate successes in our neighborhoods across the county and enhance systems that respond effectively to community identified safety needs. In Bear County, um, we can actually see an exciting decline in um, violent crime and property crimes. These are actually the number of crimes um, over the course of the last four years. In fact, other uh, quantitative data indicates that in 2010, 78% of Bear County adults felt that they actually had social or emotional support within the communities that they live in. Um, and I think that says a lot to how people feel about living in, in Bear County. Another area that we looked at was behavioral mental well-being. Health is more than just the physical body. Mental health is related to how people think, feel, and act as they cope with life, how they handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. As we noted earlier, um, the highest hospitalization rate was for um, mental uh, disorders. And you can see when looking at it by race and ethnicity, um, Bear County is actually um, the line at the bottom. And when you see it divided out by race and ethnicity, you see that we actually have um, higher rates, in particular the rate of the, uh, the black community is higher than the others for hospitalization for um, mental disorders. And these are hospitalization rates per 1,000 population. We can also look at suicide rates um, and see that particularly in the, um, in the youth population we're seeing uh, those rates go up in Texas um, and stay about the same in Bear County. But, so we're looking at the YRBS. We're still looking at just shy of 10% of high school students have attempted suicide. We can also look at binge drinking. So I can look at binge drinking on the sheet in front of me. Oh, there we go. Um, and we can see that uh, binge drinking has uh, gone up in Bear County, as it frequently does with uh, changes in the economy, um, and uh, binge drink uh, for adults, and has gone, it's actually gone slightly down in uh, the youth, the high school population. Okay, I promise I'm almost done. We can look at sexual health and uh, celebrate declines in teen pregnancy across the board in every racial and ethnic group. Um, and we can look at sexually transmitted disease, disease rates and see in general some st stability, stability with gonorrhea, syphilis, um, and HIV infection, um, but an increase in uh, chlamydia. And finally, we can look at access to care. So we have all of these things going on in our community, and we also have, um, are currently in a spot, and this report does not take into consideration um, implications of the Affordable Care Act. We see that uh, roughly 27, 28% of adults in Bear County do not have insurance um, as of 2012. Um, and just shy of 20% have actually said that they're delaying medical care because of the cost of care. Um, hopefully with uh, changes on the federal and the uh, local level, we can uh, see these numbers decline. Steve? So with all of that said, um, we do spend a lot of time looking at, okay, just what's going on in the community right now. But through the community engagement piece, we spend a lot of time asking questions about the future and what the community would like to see in the future. Thank you, Abby. Um, as uh, a member of in community, I think it's a useful distinction that we make that uh, we may work in the community, we, in organizations and stuff, but when you're engaged, you're in community. And I think the, from the perspective of in community, when we look at some of these bar charts and we wonder why it's low, what we can, the way you ordinarily would think about it in community is that the glass is half full rather than the glass is half empty. If you have the perspective that the glass is half full, then you can think about how do we get to that, capitalize on whatever strengths it's got is half full uh, to fill that glass up. So I think in community, I think we're very successful in this community about having that sort of an approach to community problem solving. And um, here, this is uh, some things that came out of the conversation, the community voice, 
Uh, some is descriptors from the, the data, but most of it is from community voice. Um, enhanced environments to support health, and we've had a number of illustrations of, of that uh, this morning, both from the judge and, and um, senator, and as well as from Abby. Uh, people in the community asking for better lighting, uh, improved parks. Uh, the salient feature, I think, of 2010 was the extent to which people know the health issues, but not only that, that they also know what the strategies are to improve health. Um, the salient feature I was saying earlier this, this time for me is that um, the social cohesion, the state of uh, civic engagement, the sense of connection across the community that we can capitalize on to take what it may seem half full to us um, and make it um, that glass even more full. Enhanced environments to support health, uh, support services for youth, elderly, and other vulnerable populations. A lot of conversation, um, a recognition of, <coughs> sorry, yeah. A lot of um, recognition on the part of members in the community at all levels, key informants, focus groups, and, um, and at community meetings about developing support services for youth and for the elder and other vulnerable populations. And some of this is based on data that, um, say the now data group bring from CNOW to stimulate conversations at community meetings. But a lot of it is just people know it. They have a good sense in their heart of what the issues are and uh, want to speak to them and have ideas about improvement. More health education. Uh, we had a conference this last uh, uh, Friday, San Antonio Health Literacy, and that's what that's about. Um, it's about how can we uh, facilitate say, interaction between physicians and, and patients in a way that um, patients can understand what is in front of them in terms of a regimen, how to, in, how to interpret and, and follow the, uh, the descriptions on the side of a bottle, and, um, and also for the physician to understand something about um, the, the person that's in front of them, and that it's, it's, a, it's an interactive um, health literacy. Uh, so more, more health education. Uh, focus on prevention, of course, that's always what we want to do. We want to figure out how to avoid something from happening rather than re uh, reacting to something that's already, already happening. But the conversation is there, you know, moving beyond, looking at what can we do in strategies to prevent uh, uh, poor health outcomes. And, of course, the one that I think is uh, so characteristic of us this year is, um, or the recognition is so characteristic, is greater community engagement. This, to me, is the foundation that we will build uh, our, our improved health and accelerate a momentum. This is the, uh, the engagement that will bring us to the table in collaborative ways and be grateful uh, for where we are and, um, and sit and come to consensus about what we can do to get even uh, better in health. Um, key themes. There are a number of these, and I'll just go through them. We've talked about it. It's uh, um, strongly values its residents and the social capital that they represent. Social capital meaning that people are willing to get together in the community and, and solve problems, uh, willing to get together in a community and go to the municipal government and say, we need a little better lighting in our neighborhood. We'd go out and walk more if we had it. Um, and whenever we say Bear County, um, it is a political entity, but it is the, the boundary inside which we define, around which we define our, our larger community. Um, as in previous assessments, data on morbidity and mortality distribution um, follow the social and economic patterns. We saw that. Uh, we have that concern as we do around the nation as wealth disparity increases, so shall and is health disparity. We have to be mindful of that. Um, otherwise, there will be um, well, you can just imagine uh, what we're already seeing. Um, improvements in the physical activity environment has had positive impacts on obesity. Uh, physical activity and nutrition are considered major health concerns. Many people in the neighborhoods want to figure out how to do a, uh, a community garden in order to get immediate access to fresh vegetables that they might not otherwise have easy access to. And there is an awareness about physical activity, just like I spoke of Woodlawn Park. You go over there this evening, those of you that are not in that area, at 7 o'clock with your tennis shoes on and shorts or whatever you wear to go for a walk, you'll find it very crowded. And, it's a, and that's a good thing. 
Um, early intervention can help alter the health trajectory of young children, and we know in the social influence model, the social determinant model, that how the children are, so are, are they also as adults. If they are ill and in adverse circumstances as young people and, and children, then uh, they will carry the burden of that consequence throughout their life, and it will express itself in, um, in uh, ill health as adults. So the earlier that we can intervene, the, the better we will be over the life course. Um, while with high rates of teen pregnancy and increasing rates of sexually transmitted disease, sexual health is, gro is of growing importance to the community. It is, in fact, as Abby said, an indicator of our progress uh, and as it is measured by Community Health Improvement Plan. It is an indicator, so we're very mindful of it. And we look at it not only in the CHA, every ch the CHA now is every three years, but we're mindful of it in, their, in the intermediate uh, period of time, data that are available from Metro Health Department and other sources, and ongoing community conversation. Um, mental health is viewed as a uh, crucial and growing issue with the need for more resources. We saw that there's an, a slight increase in, in hospitalizations for this uh, reason. Uh, there's a slight decrease in a sense of feeling good and self-assessments of health. Uh, we can imagine that that would be a difficult, that would be expected to some extent. Uh, is happening nas nationally as we have the economic downturn. Neighborhoods, there's some foreclosures and loss of job. You can imagine that that sort of thing would be a characteristic of this time. But as a community, we see it in front of us, and as a collaborative community, there are things we can do. Changes in the healthcare system, new programs, hospital facilities, and policy are working to improve access. Uh, just a wealth of things uh, by all the hospital system, university hospital, system and others, Metro Health Department, um, to meet the health needs, the growing health needs that we saw in that early line of the demographic feature that I showed. Uh, demand is increasing and it will continue to increase. And I think we're working very hard to, um, to meet that demand. And then uh, lastly, community members are in envision a healthier Bear County that is built on collaborative efforts. That's what they talk about. It's not me up here talking about that, uh, although I am. But it is the community that talks about that. And we, it's, just, it's a marvelous thing. You know, you, you go and you think, well, it's, what are we going to hear? We don't go in there and tell them what to say. We sit there and listen. And people talk about this. We're getting to be a healthier county, and we can work together to make it even healthier. Um, so there are some good things here. Uh, Abby's going to talk for a few minutes about the use of the community health assessment and close this out. Huh. So... We've got a lot of data out there. Um, that uh, piece is written. Um, you have executive uh, summaries in front of you, and we've all done a lot of talking about it. But as Steve mentioned earlier, frequently these documents end up as shelf documents. And one of the things that the Health Collaborative has done is said, um, first of all, we're not just going to uh, check it off the list and say we've completed a community health assessment. We're actually going to use our community health assessment. Um, the health collaborative has used it to define its own work and plan for its own work as well as um, the health collaborative and uh, Metro Health using it for the development of the community health improvement plan. Um, this document um, has some funders that have a reason that they would like it used, particularly the hospitals have um, some IRS requirements about having a community health assessment and then using it for community benefit planning. Um, the health department uh, can use it for its community health improvement planning. The community itself can use it that way. Um, but we've also seen it used by program planners and community members, students, and researchers, as Liz noted uh, earlier today, to meet a variety of, of uh, different needs. So in looking at how the, health, uh, the community health assessment has been used in the past, um, we are trying the health collaborative, and thanks to um, the health collaborative's partnership with um, App Addiction, um, we have been able to, the health collaborative's been able to provide the uh, report in a more useful way. You can always go to any of the hospital websites and to the health department website and download the PDF of the document. I'll tell you right now, make sure you have plenty of paper in your printer, um, and it does look better in color than it does in black and white. Um, so if that's not a deterrent for downloading it um, and printing, you can download it and use it, but be careful with the printing piece. Um, you can go to the uh, Health Collaborative's website and see the new online interaction version. This is where you all internally say, woo, that's so cool. 
Um, I don't think I can move it from here. Can we go to the, um, the uh, can you click on the interactive online version piece? Oops, no, the, uh, can you go back one slide? Yeah. And can you click on the enter box? So when you go online and are looking at the interactive version, um, you see a table of contents which you can expand or collapse to meet your needs. Um, and can you click on the piece that says uh, gender under um, demographics and social environment? So this pulls up that page in the report. Um, it also pulls up the, um, the, all of the figures, graphs, maps, tables that we used. Um, and can you just hover your cursor um, to the right of the title of the figure where it says population? Can you hover on those three little bars right there? Yeah. Um, you can now download each figure. It does come with a required, you cannot remove citation, um, to the report and the source. Um, you can print the chart itself. You can download it as a JPEG um, or a PDF image, and you can put it in your, uh, in your own reports or the doc documentation um, that you need. Um, to get here, you also do have to fill out a little survey so that we can figure out how you're using it and give us some feedback on it um, so that the Health Collaborative can continue to improve this process. Thank you very much. The next phase for us is um, the 2013-2014 Community Health Improvement Plan. Um, the CHIP process, um, if you would like to be involved, you can sign up at the Health Collaboratives table today on your way out the door. But the CHIP is going to build on the 2012 CHIP. The 2012 CHIP is available at bcchip.org. Um, It'll use the 2013 uh, Community Health Assessment, which has been designed to support that process. Um, there's a set of work groups in the five areas that we talked about earlier today. Uh, healthy eating and active living, child health and family development, uh, safe communities, behavioral mental well-being, and sexual health. Um, there'll be a series of uh, four meetings over four months um, in which the project, will, each work group will um, uh, pull together their section of the report. A whole report will be developed and it'll be opportunities for community members and partners to take action. Um, that piece uh, will, you can sign up for those work groups. Um, I encourage you to peruse the existing report that's there. And do we have any questions? Thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. Liz? Thank you, Abby and Steve. So next we have a, a presentation by our friends at Nowcast SA who have done a great job. And I'm going to go ahead and have them um, do the film. You know, for a while now, uh, we've recognized that there's a big challenge in San Antonio with regard to health. Uh, in San Antonio, we have a diabetes rate that is twice the national average, childhood obesity, adult obesity that's well above the national average. And what we're trying to do is to give folks both the information and the infrastructure they need to get healthy. It began in 1998, the Bear County Health Collaborative, uh, a collaboration between the major hospital systems to comply with some regulations to report out on the status of the community and um, their decision was to rather than do a, a, a number of different ones why not collaborate and do a common one and that was sort of the forming pr principle of the collaborative. I think there are a couple of important considerations that have that, uh, to think about as we think about the assessments. Um, one is is that it is a principal means for the community to assess the status of its community health, uh, population-based health. A health assessment is normally used with looking at the recommendations once the data has been analyzed. This is then shared with many other stakeholders and the stakeholders is, is the local health department, the hospital system, nonprofits, and these are then programs that will be implemented in the city. 
you know, what is it about those thousand people that walk through the door that have changed their health outlook in a real material and sustainable way over time? That's a different type of measurement, it's a different type of rigor, and a different type of accountability maybe than many are used to. But that's a change in San Antonio that we know is going to get us much closer to yielding the return that we want on the right side of the equal sign. The health assessment is invaluable to a healthcare system like Methodist. We use the assessment to help guide our community outreach efforts. As a matter of fact, each of our hospitals has a specific community outreach plan whereby we use the health priorities of the CHIP and the outcomes of the CHIP to make sure, all working together, we can make an impact on the health of our community. We broadened out from hospitals to community-based organizations to other parts of the health infrastructure, including university like Our Lady of the Lake University and the medical school. So the stakeholder representation on the board has broadened. And just like uh, you can see around you this morning um, at the rollout, you can see just how much, uh, how the breadth of the participation of the, um, in the assessment by just looking around and seeing how many people are actually here that are showing interest in this. As time has gone by, um, there's been greater and greater uh, community participation in this. Uh, it's, it has broadened out uh, considerably. Edison High School in San Antonio. Now, uh, the, the district has made the decision to put the lights on in their practice field there at night. I was driving by at 9 o'clock at night and couldn't even get into the parking lot. I didn't know what was happening, but then when I looked, it was the car lo uh, parking lot was packed with cars of people who at 9 o'clock at night were walking the tracks. That goes to show you there wasn't anything in that community at night that people could go walk. And who's going to walk in the middle of the day with 100 degree weather? Those are the types of decisions. They may mean a small thing, for that, but for those communities and for those people taking advantage of that, that's going to benefit their health. It gives the municipal uh, government, let's say, uh, and the county government an opportunity to look at the contextual issues upstream and what can they do to help uh, neighborhoods change the character and the dynamic of the neighborhoods that will improve behaviors. For example, better lighting, better sidewalks, improved parks. People, I think, we found in the 2010 assessment, the most salient thing that I think came out of the 2010 assessment is the extent to which people know what the health issues are and they know what the strategies are they need to employ, but they don't have the opportunity. Uh, it's all about giving folks the opportunity to get healthy and some of the motivation to do it too. Uh, we've set very specific goals uh, to lower the diabetes rate, the childhood obesity rate, the adult obesity rate. Uh, we've made some good progress on a couple of those, uh, but we still have a long way to go by 2020 to hit our goals. Where we're going in San Antonio going into the year 2020 is wholly owned and born out of the hearts and minds of San Antonio themselves. We have a very dynamic board and um, a very dynamic community. Uh, the uh, county judge's office is very much a part of this. Fair County Hospital District, along with the Center for Healthcare Services, and our Human Services Department within Bear County, headed by Aurora Sanchez, is using the health assessment program to identify uh, where we ought to be putting our resources and the ability that we have to, to assess those needs and to answer those needs. And uh, we've become a model around the country for the way to do assessments. And what we're about to do, and we'll announce it during this meeting, is a community health improvement plan, which is the action plan from the assessment. We don't want it to be a fixed document on a shelf. We want to do something with it. And so we have, beginning in uh, 2010, and now reviewing it in uh, 2013, uh, I mean the Community Health Improvement Plan. Um, so we're, we're in a very good place. We have what we call the CHA, Community Health, Assist uh, Health Assessment, and the CHIP, the Community Health Improvement Plan, the CHA-CHIP connection. And um, it's very powerful. And it's uh, a lot of interest, a lot of people come to the table, the stakeholders, and have conversations with us. And it is a model around the country. So we've done very well in this city in that regard. Congratulations, Bear County and San Antonio, for taking ownership of your health. We now invite you to join us as we continue on the journey of community health improvement. The CHIP is about to begin, 
and I'm on board. Hello, my name is Sandy Miranda and I'm the President and CEO of the YMCA of Greater San Antonio and I'm on board. Hi, I'm Nelson Wolf, Bear County Judge and I'm on board. Methodist Healthcare is on board. Our Lady of Lake University is on board. So as the Chief Epidemiologist for San Antonio, I am on board with the health assessment. And again, as I had discussed, this is crucial in identifying disease burden for the city. So I'm very proud to say that after 16 years, we have so much to celebrate because we've done so much. But I have to tell you that the Health Collaborative doesn't stand here alone or ahead of any one agency in this room. We actually, we stand next to you in celebration of the growth and tremendous impact that we've seen over the past couple of years. You see, it's not just the Board of Directors of the Health Collaborative or our awesome Health Collaborative team that works tirelessly to do efforts and bring partnerships to the table like these today. Um, that can take a bow and say thank you. You know, we've, we've done it, we did it. It's actually everyone in this room today and in the community out there who is dedicated to creating opportunity that leads to better and improved health. Those that work tirelessly to bring new resources, fund projects, align missions, and all with the collective vision of a better and healthier neighborhood, district, precinct, San Antonio, Bear County, region, state, nation. This year we have the great honor of submitting a, na uh, a nomination for our community, defined by our partners, everyone here today, for the Robert Wood Johnson Roadmaps to Health Recognition Award, which honors outstanding community partnerships that are helping people live healthier lives. Robert Wood Johnson, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson nomination for our community um, gives credit to the collaborative efforts that have yielded better results, like a drop in obesity rates, reduced teen pregnancy, and increased uh, teen pregnancy prevention education, improved access to community resources, just to name a few examples. The role of our stakeholders in providing health is so diverse, and I'm going to just give a couple of examples. We have great community partners with NowCast, whose mission is to promote and facilitate an inclusive civic conversation by empowering neighbors to identify common issues and share information through education, training, community news, events, and multimedia. And thanks to NowCast and her team, they were able to make this possible, the, the, the video today, and will continue to do these types of publications to really um, share with all of you the different work that's happening by a lot of different um, uh, partners here today. We also have a great partner in Health Access San Antonio, HASA, who is a nonprofit community collaborative charged to securely exchange health information amongst providers and physicians in community. HASA's data will offer a unique view on how care is being delivered across care providers in the community and assist in identifying uh, patterns and trends in care, needs for services, and developing men benchmarks for uh, the region. YMCA is a leader in our community for the integration of family health and wellness with a large outreach and impact through programs like the Y Living Program, Ciclovia, and their team, um, team up effort with San Antonio Metro Health Department and their diabetes prevention program, who seeks to make lifestyle changes or help uh, families make lifestyle changes to help prevent or delay the disease, work with family members to reduce the entire family's risk, and manage the disease if they are already, if they have already received a diagnosis and teach them how they can take control of their health safely and manage the symptoms of diabetes. We also have a great partnership with uh, Project Words Teen Pregnancy Prevention Collaborative that includes members like Healthy Futures of Texas and UT Teen Health. Um, that although, while, although we have a decline in teen birth rates, we're still above the national average and there's yet lots of work to do or hospital systems like UHS, Christus, Methodist, Baptist, that are always seeking ways to partner with school districts to offer school-based clinics, mobile clinic services, and screenings to further increase access to healthcare for our families. 
and many more agencies that, that are looking beyond the individual mission, but are seeking partners, collaborators, supporters to further extend their reach, reduce duplication, and leverage each other's resources. There is no doubt that the need in our community is great and will continue to be so. And the work of the community will not be easy, easily resolved. No one agency, at least not ours, can say that they can do the work alone. It takes an entirety, entire community deeply invested and profoundly passionate for a better, better quality of life. For those of you who um, were here early enough and got to visit the tables uh, of our member organizations around, I encourage you to visit with them again as you leave today. They have valuable information for you and are consistently looking for opportunities to work together with you. And I'll close with this. Um, I came across this quote actually as I was sitting in Sunday service one day. And it was really talking about something completely different, but I related it to the work that we do here in community. And that is that coming together is the beginning Staying together is progress, but working together is success. The time is right and the time is now. And we ask for your support, your participation in the CHIP process as we get started. Please sign up for any of the work groups or multiple work groups, or if you need more information about the CHIP or the health assessment or the process, please call us. We are always ready and eager to collaborate with you. Thank you again for your invaluable time this morning.